You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host and bourbon soak storyteller, Juliet Miranda. Hey there, y'all. It's Juliet Miranda. Welcome to episode 253 of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. I have a bourbon soak story for y'all today about joining a winter circle and being chewed to death by chihuahuas. But first, bourbon. Cheers, y'all. Ah, oh, oh, bourbon. So like everything, <laughs> every day here in New Orleans, my guy and I are celebrating. But this is a little bit more of a personal celebration for us because we have officially had our dream New Orleans home for one year. It's a little crazy to think about how much has happened in the past year. And I'll tell you, this wild world that we have here in New Orleans continues to surprise me on a regular basis. Mostly, this is for the good, especially now that more and more people are filling the French Quarter. There is music on every street, there's amazing food everywhere, and just tons of new experiences to have. And with all of that, for us comes a little bit of a new comfort, because now there's no need for us to feel like we have to do it all before we catch a flight home. We just are home, and all of this is here every day. Of course, New Orleans does make for a very different home than either my guy or I have ever had, which does make for some less than pleasant surprises that we try to do our best to avoid. And it's these little surprises that's one of the reasons why our group of friends always walks each other home after a night out. We just did this last night, as a matter of fact. And it doesn't matter who you are or how big and tough you are, no one in our group ever walks home alone. Now, we do this out of courtesy and safety because, unfortunately, the French Quarter right now does get a little dicey after 11 o'clock at night. Now, me, I have my own little safety dance that I do, whether I'm walking to the gym alone in the morning or to a bar at night with my guy. And it's not a lot. I just make sure that if I'm carrying a purse, the strap is firmly gripped in my hand, not dangling off of my shoulder, and I always have my mini can of mace at the ready. My guy will relocate his wallet to his front pocket, and we always try to walk with purpose no matter how much we've had to drink. The idea is just to lessen our risk of being targeted. And it works well enough, I mean, at least in that we still have the wallets and phones that we moved here with. Not everyone who comes to the French Quarter, however, is so diligent about safety. In fact, the other night, we encountered two female tourists who clearly were not aware of their surroundings. They had giant tumblers of hurricanes sticking to their hands. Their purses were open and falling off their arms. And they were wearing the kind of heels meant for leaning, not walking our uneven streets here. I'll tell you, they were easier to knock over than a gas station. Which is probably why the kid in the dark hoodie decided to creep up behind them. He was a little guy, scrawny and obviously opportunistic. And I nudge my guy just as I see this guy try to reach out and grab one of the girl's purses. I think my guy might have been Batman in another life because he doesn't even hesitate. He lowers his voice to a register I didn't even know he had, and he yells out to this kid, loud and deep enough to just send him sprinting away without the purse that he had hoped to snatch. The two girls were resoundingly grateful, and I was so proud of my guy for stepping up like that. Because I don't know if it's something I would have done, especially now that in hindsight, I'm confronted with the big what-ifs. What if that kid hadn't run off? What if he had a gun? Of course, the thing is, you never know how you are going to respond to a situation until you're in it. Like when I lost my best friends on Bourbon Street. Yeah, that happened. You see, this past weekend, I played host to my two oldest friends in the world. 
Texas, and Birdie. Texas I have talked about before. She is the Winston Wolf of my friends. The one who fixes, solves, and kicks serious ass when needed. Texas is, in fact, the one responsible for introducing Birdie to our little social circle. She did it like she does everything, with zero bullshit. One day in our very early 20s, Texas just showed up with Birdie in tow and said, don't worry, she can hang. That was a bold claim. Texas knew full well I have a low tolerance for high-maintenance friends. So to hang, one must be smart, self-sufficient, and a good drinker. Fortunately, Birdie proved to be all of that and more. She became the wild card of our trio, a former punk rock bartender with a fearless case of wanderlust. There is no destination too far-fetched or funky for this girl. Through the years, Texas and I would get a series of random postcards picturing some exotic destination. A mountaintop in Peru, a busy street in Tokyo, and there navigating it all would be Birdie. She chased after land the way I did love and Texas did logic, which all has, in its own occasionally fucked up way, given our collective friendship the balance that it needed to survive. To find myself just days ago sitting on my New Orleans balcony with them both was a little surreal, particularly when the last time it was just the three of us together was more than 10 years ago. And that was at my bachelorette party. Oh, y'all, having a bachelorette party was not high on my list of wedding priorities. Part of the reason I was getting married was to never have to go out as a single woman again. I was done with the night prowling and the cock dodging. But Texas and Bertie, who were both already married, convinced me otherwise. It's a celebration, they said. This is your chance to go out with the girls without any of the pressure of being single. It'll just be us, they promised. Well, when they put it like that, how could I argue? Still, I wanted to avoid the usual bachelorette trappings. There would be no penis balloons for me, thank you very much. Instead, I booked a car service to take us to the least likely bachelorette destination that I could think of. The racetrack. Horse racing, that is. Arlington Race Park in Illinois has been hosting live horse racing for decades. And in that time, it's acquired all of the charm of My Fair Lady without losing that Charles Bukowski edge. I suppose the three of us fell somewhere in the middle. Well, two of us did, anyway. Now, I have always considered playing the horses something of a lark. Lord knows I don't have the head for the math behind it. I really don't. I just stare at the program until I find a particular horse name I take a shine to. And then I bet across the board. Meaning that for one horse, I bet on it to either win, place, or show. It is the easiest bet to make and win. Assuming, like me, you pay zero attention to odds or payouts. Which I explained to Texas and Birdie as well as I could. Texas, whose main goal was to match me for shots that day, appreciated the simplicity of this strategy. And Bertie followed suit. We each chose a horse, placed our bets, and then gathered at the finish line to watch the race. For the minute or two these races last, it is really intense. If I knew anything about other sports, I'm sure I could make a better comparison to game-winning free throws or touchdowns Just those singular moments where a single move means everything. That's what horse racing feels like, with the added stake of being invested in the winner. When those horses plow across the finish line, you feel it. So the crowd is screaming as the race finishes, but no one more than Birdie, whose horses just come in first, with a solid 50 bucks in winnings for her. My own horse had placed, which meant I had ten bucks coming my way that I fully intended on parlaying into my next shot of booze. Texas is right behind me, but Birdie 
she has other plans. That taste of winning opened uncharted territory that she was desperate to explore. So she motions toward the paddock and says she wants to check out the horses for the next race. What she hoped to learn by looking at the horses is beyond us, so Texas and I just wave and wish her luck. Then, like a couple of assholes, we proceed to get hammered at the bar. And we're not talking everyday hammered. This is, I'm getting fucking married, hammered. It was not pretty, it really wasn't. (laughs) Four hours go by before we remember Birdie. And that's only because Texas had run out of cigarettes. I turn and look to my left, smiling, because I'm so drunk, I am fully expecting to see Birdie next to me. I'd been having so much fun, I just assumed that she would be there. But all I get is an eyeful of flesh, courtesy of the large man who'd saddled up next to me. When he sees me smiling, he winks and taps his wedding band because he thinks I'm flirting with him, or maybe because he's flirting with me, but either way, ew, no. Texas scans the bar and there's no birdie. We both shake our heads, doing our level best to uncloud the drunken oblivion and remember where we left her. I have a vague recollection of horses being involved, which obviously makes sense seeing as how we are at the fucking track. But then it hits me. Birdie went to the paddock. We stumble in that general direction, feeling both shitty and annoyed. Shitty because we really should have paid more attention to our friend's whereabouts, and annoyed because damn that Birdie and her fucking wanderlust. This wasn't the first time she'd wandered off on us. Some shiny object was always catching her eye. And I suppose the same could be said for me once, too. Only I was far easier to locate. All you had to do was head for the backstage gate or closest tour bus, and I'd be latched onto something long-haired and musical. Birdie was harder to pin down, and we were too drunk to make any sort of reliable search and rescue team this time. She wasn't by the paddocks. She wasn't by the bedding kiosks or restaurant. And I'm thinking, you know what? Let her find her own damn way home. But before we can turn around and leave... I hear her. Birdie's laugh has always reminded me of scales on the piano. F major, to be specific. I turn toward the happy trill, and there she is, in the fucking winter circle. She's holding a glass of champagne and stroking the mane of a very large horse, while a circle of exceedingly well-dressed people clink their glasses and cheer. We call out, and she motions for us to come join her and introduces us to the owner of Jake Ryan, the horse that Bertie has made a straight wager on to win the last race. Apparently, she and the owner had gotten friendly down in the paddock. And while Texas and I got our drunk on, Bertie had been invited to watch the races from the owner's box, where she'd learned everything there was to know about how to pick a winner. Ladies, she says, Dinner is on me tonight. Well, she's elated, Texas is thrilled, and me, I'm proud. Because seriously, y'all, it is not every day you can profit off of a bachelorette party. Since then, although me and Birdie and Texas have all kept in touch and seen each other individually, we'd pretty much given hope on the thought of all three of us getting together again. There was just too much to navigate, from careers to kids to finances. So out of all of the weekends in the last 10 years, I can't say why last weekend was the one that worked for all of us. Maybe the planets aligned. Maybe now that we're older, we appreciate our friendship all the more. All I can say is that Texas found her way from California, and Bertie flew in from Chicago, and the three of us reunited here in New Orleans. Our night started and ended with cocktails. No surprise there. First at my place, then over dinner, and eventually at a Bourbon Street piano bar. I wanted the girls to get the full French Quarter experience, right down to the pools of pee and crawfish water on the sidewalks. And I warned them, I did, I said, y'all, watch your step and your purses. 
But I wonder now if maybe I should have said more. Because as the official ringleader of this Bacchanalian rodeo, it was my responsibility to steer us clear of trouble. And that is definitely not my strong suit. What I am good at is leading to liquor. We hit the bar and Texas and Bertie secure our drinks while I stake out a courtyard table by the band. This is not a good band. It really isn't. They are a hack band who plays cheater notes and flubs lyrics. But for a tip, they will play anything. And quite honestly, after going so long without live music, it really doesn't matter how shitty they sound as long as they're loud. I have lined up song requests like shots, because my greatest pleasure in life is fucking with a piano band. So I've got them playing The Monkees, Macklemore, The Time Warp from Rocky Horror. And for the first hour, it's awesome. Bertie and Texas are mainlining Cult 45 cocktails, which, quite honestly, kind of terrifies me the moment they bring them to the table. This is the boozy equivalent of epinephrine. It's made of gin, Jaeger, and fucking Red Bull. And I'm looking at my girls because just seeing these cocktails sitting on the table just triggers my barf reflex. I mean, ew, right? Just ew, da. The girls claimed that they needed the caffeine to keep up with me. So, who am I to ruin a good time? Drink your shitty college cocktails, girls. It's fine. So we're singing. We're cheering. And it's all so much fun that I really don't see it coming. When I return from the bathroom and find both Texas and Bertie gone. Just poof, gone. No more girlfriends. I'm confused. And then I am annoyed because, God damn it, girls, you never abandon a good table in a bar, especially one with full drinks on it. At the very least, you will lose your table and drinks to sneaky tourists. At worst, you'll wake up in a bathtub of ice, minus a kidney and nursing a hell of a roofie hangover. They really, really should have known better. So I sit back down figuring they're just out having a smoke. Neither one of them smokes full-time anymore, but something about the booze and my company drives them to it. (laughs) So I expect that they're going to be back in another minute or two. Five minutes go by, then 10, and there's nothing. There's no sign of them. I don't want to get up because I don't want to lose this table, so I text them a combination of frowny faces and cocktail emojis. It was the nicest way that I could ask, where the fuck are you, without sounding like a complete bitch. And as I do this, I have to wonder, who am I? 10, 15 years ago, I would have been all, you ladies are on your own. And then I would just grab another drink and cap myself out by the band without a care in the world. But now, I'm actually concerned about the well-being of my friends. And I feel myself getting a little twitchy when more time goes by and there's no response from them. I am relieved when I see my phone light up and find a text from Texas. Except, it's not really a text. Because all she has sent me is three puppy dog emojis. What the fuck does that mean? I know she's had a lot of cocktails, but come on, use your damn words, Texas. She follows it up with a series of exclamation points, which immediately puts me on my feet. Because exclamation points are never good, and combine them with the puppy dog faces, and I'm seriously worried. It's not like Bourbon Street is overrun with feral dogs, just drunks and bums, but enough of those bums have pet dogs. So as I race out, I am positive I am going to find Texas in the gutter being chewed to death by a chihuahua. It's hard to see much of anything through all the commotion on the street. Since the pandemic restrictions were lifted in Orleans Parish, Bourbon Street has been back to its usual frenetic pace. But in between the fishbowls of booze and flung beads, I see Texas. She's sitting on the street corner being completely overtaken by a bulldog. Its stubby little legs are just stomping all over Texas, leaving wet prints and slobber in its wake. And I immediately feel like an idiot because 
This is no vicious hobo chihuahua. This is a quarter bulldog. He is one of three bulldogs that I know who live in the French Quarter, and he's a regular at my favorite bar. (laughs) Any given day, you can find him and his human camped out at a table with the bulldog making regular trips behind the bar to sneak bites from the prime rib the bartender saves for him. He is a good dog, and apparently rather smitten with Texas, who is doing her best to push the lovey beast off of her. I stare down at my friend, and I say, This? This is what you're doing? I thought you were dead. She stands up and brushes herself off while giving me a good, long eye roll. She says, Geez, Mom, chill out. What I want to say is, who the fuck are you calling mom? And I am a heartbeat away from really getting into it with her right there on the street. When I remember, we still don't know where Birdie is. Which I explained to Texas, and she's completely unconcerned. She just shrugs and she says, I'm sure she's around here somewhere. Yeah, there are literally hundreds of people around us, and even more corners and alleys and ditches that Bertie could have stumbled into. So this cavalier attitude was not exactly welcome in this moment. And again, I get that exasperated stare from Texas as she pulls out her phone. Oh, good idea, I say. Text her the dolphin emoji. I'm sure she'll know what it means. Texas ignores my snark and instead opens the Find My Friend app on her phone. Ooh, right. Technology. I had forgotten about that. A few years back, Birdie had insisted that we connect with her on this friend tracking app. Not to stalk each other, but to keep up with her crazy travels. And it was kind of fun watching her little pin cross oceans and continents. I'd kind of forgotten about that app over the past year. Texas quickly locates Birdie and points back at the club we'd left. Apparently, like any reasonable grown-up, Birdie had returned to look for us. Only, she's not at our original table. She's not at the bar or in the courtyard. She's in a small alcove off the courtyard. Its original purpose had been a storage area of sorts, meant to hold cases of booze and supplies, but the bar owners had crammed a small table in there to accommodate for social distancing. Bertie has her back to us, but she's not looking toward the band. She's looking at three guys who have surrounded her. They formed a semicircle with Bertie seated in the center, and her head is exactly cock high. Even my cool-headed Texas gasps at the sight because I'll tell you, It did not look good. This was no winter circle Birdie had joined. My entire body just clenches. I mean, this is the kind of situation where you just, you don't know what you're going to do until you're there. And I didn't hesitate. I saw my friend. I saw a threat. And I reacted. Had I maybe, I don't know, paused just for a moment. I might have noticed that these three guys were all of maybe 22. And it's not that looks dictate intent or anything, but I also would have noticed that they were all holding cocktails, not Bertie's head. In fact, it was Bertie who had her hands full. Because she was tying one of the guy's shoelaces. I'm not kidding. This is what my girlfriend was doing. Total stranger, she was bent forward, just lacing up his shoes like a weirdly nurturing but no less kind person does in a bar, I guess. But that's not what I saw. No, (laughs) that is not at all what I saw because I was too busy leaping forward like a deranged puma, yelling something completely unintelligible and stupid. With both of my hands, I knock right into the guy's shoulders. I mean, just bam, and I send him stumbling backwards into a stack of empty booze cartons. His friends are all, what the fuck? And Bertie is all, what the fuck, girl? And Texas just stares at me and she asks, who are you? You know, (laughs) I'm not entirely sure sometimes. 
I help the kid up and I apologize profusely as he and his buddies run off. I suppose at the very least I can take comfort in knowing I gave them a good story to tell about their time in New Orleans and the crazy lady who thought she was breaking up a very dirty group hug. The girls and I order up a round of drinks and we settle down at a table for the band's last set. At first, we're a little quiet. But as the absurdity of our night creeps in, we all begin to giggle and soon are just consumed by hysterics. Part of me wants to ask, when did we become these people? People who tie strangers' shoelaces and play with random dogs on the street and apparently go Godzilla when we sense danger, no matter how imagined it may be. Does that make us old? I don't know. Our evolution as people and as friends over the last decade is staggering, to say the least. I don't know if it's age. I think it's just that our motivations and our actions are worlds different than they once were. And I'll admit, it's a little frightening sometimes. I always used to know who I was and what I was going to do, but now I don't know what to expect, especially from myself. Still, as the three of us sat there in that funky Bourbon Street bar, together after 10 years of separation, just singing along to some off-key ditty from the 80s, I did know one thing about us for certain. I fucking love what we're becoming. Cheers, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me through a little bit of a taste of my New Orleans here on the Unwritable Rant podcast. If you want to hear more stories about Texas or my other girlfriend, Crazy Town, or any of my other crazy bourbon-soaked adventures, just go to theunwritablerant.com. You'll find the entire backlog of episodes, and you'll find a little link where you can even buy me a drink. It'll take you to a secure PayPal page where you can make a one-time donation to support this show. You keep me in booze, and I promise I will keep you in boozy stories. Also, you can join me on YouTube on Monday nights at 7 p.m. Central Time. Just look for Juliet Miranda on YouTube. I host a little show called Bourbon Soaked Live. There's no real format to it. We just hang out. There's a great group of people that gather in the chat, and we talk about all sorts of crazy things. Life, booze, fun. So join us Monday nights, 7 p.m. Central Time. Now me... I think I'm going to go find a little more trouble in that French quarter out there. So I hope you all have a great week. I'll be back soon to share more bourbon soaked stories with y'all. Cheers. Go to the unwritablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Girl, you as pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make a way up to Bourbon, a couple hurricanes and a hand grenade and get blown away. Let the chips fall where they may. It is all the same, what you say, bon ton. Hey, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be too little like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be too little like this